Let's start off with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. O blessed Virgin Mary, Queen of heaven and earth, Mother of God, Mother of mercy, Our Lady of mercy, we ask you to please intercede on our behalf before your Son, Jesus. We entrust this parish mission completely into your immaculate and merciful hands. As we pray together, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Joseph, Saint Michael, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I've got to get this open. This is really important. I'm not going to get into the story about why it is, but if, if I have a regular bottle, just a regular water bottle, I'll carry it everywhere, and some people in here might drive nuts because it drives my mom's best friend nuts. So I get this one that stays open so I don't carry it around. Very important information for you guys to know. But this actually is. I want, you know, I want to make sure this is abundantly clear for everybody. The sacramental life of the church is the absolute primary source of grace for us, with the Eucharist being the source and summit. The things I'm going to discuss with you on how to be set on fire, so to speak, in no way, shape, or form replace those but in a certain sense, can help to enhance them. Also, we're going to be talking about the diary of St. Faustina. And as Catholics, this is private revelation. We're not required to believe in it. And there you go. Those are my kind of the two. I got to make sure that I get in there so people don't get confused. <laughs> so anyhow... Just a really quick background of me and my credentials. I don't really have any big credentials. My name's Joe Goring. I'm just a great sinner who needs God's mercy. And I paint houses for a living. I don't have any fancy theology degrees. Every time I tried to go to college to get one, I felt like God was like... Quit trying to go get your degree, Joe. I want you to do something else. So, that's what I did. So anyhow, about seven and a half years ago, I had a massive conversion to the Catholic faith. I was raised Catholic, kind of ish, sort of. We weren't, I wasn't really following the faith. I didn't really know my faith. It wasn't a big part of my family life. But about... Seven and a half years ago, I had a massive conversion. I mean massive because I was completely outside of the church. I was lost. And within the first six months of me coming back into God's grace, don't ask me how this happened. It was just a miracle of God. I read the diary of St. Faustina which is over 600 pages on two occasions in the first six months. And I had also done the consecration to Jesus through Mary in the first six months, right? I'm telling you guys, it just, it felt, it literally fell in my lap. And basically, for the last seven and a half years after doing these things, like in that first six months, I was set so on fire that I made a bold move and I basically sold everything that I had, which wasn't much, I paint houses for a living. Um, and I went off and I became a missionary for three and a half years and I went on a walk with Jesus. And during this time, I've had an incredible opportunity to meet so many people all around the country I've traveled to 25 different dioceses. I've worked with over 20 parishes. I've befriended hundreds and hundreds of homeless people. 
people in hospitals, nursing homes, rich people, middle class people, poor people, faithful people, people who don't have faith. And I think in, in that time, I've just had a, lo I've had a lot of encounters and a lot of experiences, and that's really what I'm gonna try to share with you, but to be even more specific, with the churchgoers, most of these people have done divine mercy and Mary in consecration. And many of them are getting set on fire with God's love. Many of them. And that's great hope for us. Great hope. And then some of them are only getting set a little bit on fire. And in my experience and in these encounters, there always seems to be something very similar in nature with those who aren't getting set on fire. So that's what we're going to focus on, because I want you guys to understand the importance of this before you even get there. The importance of this before we even get there, because the entire goal for me, like the overlying theme, of course, everything is to get us to Jesus, right? Everything's to get us to heaven. Everything's for our salvation, right? But when it comes to being set on fire, there's one, there's a couple of really big key ingredients. And one of them, one of the main ones, is our image of God. And why this is such a key ingredient you guys, don't, I don't want you to take my word for it. So this is from Divis and Misericordia from St. Pope John Paul II. Section 13. Therefore, the church professes and proclaims conversion. Conversion to God always consists in discovering his mercy. That is, in discovering that love which is patient and kind. Authentic knowledge of the God of mercy, the God of tender love, is a constant and inexhaustible source of conversion not only as a momentary interior act, but also as a permanent attitude, as a state of mind. Those who come to know God in this way, who see him in this way, can live only in the state of being continually converted to him. Those who see God in this way, what is St. Pope John Paul II talking about? He's talking about our image of God. And how does he say that we need to see him? As the God of mercy and tender love. And when we come to see him in that way, we can live only in the state of being continually converted to him. It's a pretty powerful statement, huh? But how does that conversion happen? It doesn't just happen on its own. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things uh, that help us with our conversion. But number one is God's grace. Number one is God's grace. 1 John chapter 4 says, We love because he loved us first. And when we receive God's grace, when we have that encounter with his mercy, and we respond to it, that's a big way of how our conversion happened. So, image is important. You guys got that, right? Now, I want to read to you what Jesus says to St. Faustina in the diary as the key to unlocking the treasures of his grace. We need those graces to have conversion, right? 
Diary Entry 1578. The graces of my mercy are drawn by means of one vessel only, and that is trust. The more a soul trusts, the more it will receive. Souls that tr trust boundlessly are a great comfort to me because I pour all the treasures of my graces into them. So what is Jesus saying is the key to unlock the treasures of his grace. Trust. But he gets even deeper than that into the diary on about 30 different occasions. He gets more specific into what he wants, what that trust looks like. And he's pointing to a key attribute of him. He wants us to trust in his goodness and his mercy. He wants us to trust in his goodness and his mercy. And the more a soul trusts in those, the more he is going to set them on fire. All right. You guys know the keys are being set on fire. Got to have the right image. Got to trust in God's mercy and goodness to receive the graces for your conversion. Parish mission's over. Wow, everybody's happy now. Look at all the smiles. Nobody was smiling before, but everybody's smiling now. Wouldn't it be nice if it was that easy? Wouldn't that be nice? Unfortunately, we have a very big problem. And this stems back from who likes to give us all their problems? Adam and Eve. Right? Adam and Eve. Like, where'd the problem come from? Oh, it's just Adam and Eve, you know, back, way back in the day, right? I'm like, stop it, Adam and Eve, would you? And this comes from something that happened in that original fall. This is from Catechism 397 and 399. Man, tempted by the devil, let his trust in his creator die in his heart. In abusing his freedom, disobeyed God's command. This is what man's first sin consisted of. All subsequent sin would be disobedience toward God and lack of trust in his goodness. Scripture portrays the tragic consequences of this first disobedience. Adam and Eve immediately lose the grace of original holiness. They become afraid of the God of whom they have conceived a distorted image, that of a God jealous of his prerogatives. All subsequent sin would be, that's us, all subsequent sin would be disobedience toward God and lack of trust in his goodness. And we also, in a certain sense, everybody probably to a different extent, have received a distorted image of God. What happened with Adam and Eve when they first sinned? They didn't, they didn't run up to Jesus and give him a hug and say, I'm sorry, right? They ran and hid. They ran away. They no longer trusted in his goodness. They no longer saw him as who he was. Love and mercy itself. So if we already have the problem of a lack of trust in his goodness because of Adam and Eve, right? And... We also have a problem where, really, some, some people struggle with this more than others. I really struggle with it a lot. A distorted image of God. And these are the things that we're finding out from G Jesus says we've got to trust in his goodness. St. Pope John Paul II says we have to have the right image of him. We have a double whammy. And it gets even worse. Because it's actually a triple whammy. The enemy of our salvation has been using this against us since the beginning. 
all the way back to Adam and Eve, our distorted image of God and lack of trust in his goodness. You know, see if this rings a bell for anybody in here. When we go through suffering, when we get across, things don't go our way in life, right? When it gets tough, right? We're talking about Catholicism, not like fuzzy bears. This isn't easy. It's not easy. But with God's grace, he's going to bring us through it. When you have those struggles, when you have those crosses, when you have losses, when things don't go your way, when you reach that darkness, that is when the enemy is going to come in the most. When it's the difficult times, that is when we need to trust in his goodness and his mercy the most. In those moments, your God doesn't love you. Stop praying for mercy. Stop dedicating your life to Jesus. Stop following the commandments. And also, if we have a big fall, if we have a big fall, don't go to that confessional. You're not good enough for this Jesus. There's no mercy for you. You'll never add up. If you guys ever hear those voices, don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. So how, you know, I'm, <laughs> sounds pretty rough now, right? How are we going to get through this problem? There's hope, guys. A lot of it. And there's, a lot, there's been a lot of hope for a long time. But God's giving us two very, very powerful things to help get us to that right image of him. To help get us to trusting in him. Mary and consecration and the message of divine mercy. This image, God doesn't do anything by mistake, right? He doesn't. He doesn't send Our Lady of Guadalupe down to Mexico because he's like, you know what, I think I'll just have a new feast day for my mom. No. There was a purpose. There's a purpose with this. This image is absolutely, the more I've gotten into this and the more I've done this, you guys, it's extraordinarily important. God is pointing to a huge problem that we have. He wants us to know who he is. He wants us to know who he is. Yes, we do need to repent. We do need to repent. We do need to speak the truth. All of these things. We do need to ask the Lord for his forgiveness and his mercy. But he doesn't want us to forget who he is. He's not our judge right now. That day will come when we die or when he returns. He's the merciful Savior and he wants us to know. He wants us to try with everything that we have. If you have sin in your life, do whatever you can to get rid of it. I'm not going to say go do whatever you want because that is not what Jesus said. He said go and sin no more. But he also recognizes our weakness and our frailty. Right? That's why he came to save us. He doesn't want us, not, not only does he not want us to forget, he wants us to know on an even deeper level how much he loves us. How much he loves us so that we can love him back and worship him for the right reasons. His mercy and his goodness and because of what he did by coming down here and being crucified for our salvation. All right, I got a joke for you. We got we, we to take a little break. All right, so... I heard there was going to be some retired people here tonight. So as I was online researching, trying to find a good joke for retired people, but none of them work. All right, 
I, I, got, I got another one for you. If you guys want one more? Yeah? Okay. Well, you guys have to participate on this one. All right? You got to participate. Knock, knock. Hatch. Oh, God bless you all. All right. <laughs> so much serious stuff, right? Like, I'm like, oh my gosh, we're talking about so much serious stuff. Like, we, Jesus wants us to have joy, right? The world is a mess, and we need to do whatever we can to try to help bring souls to Jesus, to pray for them, to help with our own salvation, but also theirs, right? That we need to do that. But at the same time, he wants us to have joy in knowing who he is. So let's have that joy. Okay, back into the serious stuff. I'm just kidding. So for the rest of the talk, we're going to get a little bit more focused on the divine mercy image itself, um, how that relates to the sacrament of confession, sacrament of reconciliation, where we think the divine mercy image comes from. But first, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself. It's my favorite thing to do, guys. Do it all the time, right? Anybody who went to the other, like the other talks are like, yeah, he really likes. No, I'm just kidding. I really don't. It's not always easy for me to get up here and, and reveal some of my past or sometimes even my future. It's not an easy thing for me. But this is the truth as to how I first encountered Jesus. So back when I was in like ninth grade, a freshman in high school, I made a really, really big mistake. And so we were about to go for confirmation, and the church was like, all right, we're going to have you all go to confession. I'll get cleaned out before you go to confirmation, right? And here's the big mistake that I made. I had committed some really, really bad sins. And what the church designates those as are mortal sins. The Catechism, 1857. For a sin to be mortal, three conditions must together be met. Mortal sin is sin whose object is grave matter and which is also committed with full knowledge and deliberate consent. It was grave matter. I had full knowledge and I deliberately went through. And to make things even worse, I deliberately did not tell the priest. And, you know, I was like, it's none of this guy's business. It's what everybody else is doing out in the world. Like, whatever, I'm, I'm not telling this guy that. And why it was such a big mistake is, because this sin was mortal, I was severed. I was no longer in the state of grace. And, um, you know, he is the vine, we are the branches. Apart from him, we can do nothing. And I was apart from him. And the next, how, what this resulted in from being apart from him, for the next 20 years of my life, I stopped going to church. I stopped believing in God. And those mortal sins that I committed, I started to do that every single day. For 20 years, every single day of my life. I did the math. 20 years is over 7,000 days that I lived and committed mortal sin and was out of God's grace. But there's good news. And his name is Jesus. So about seven, seven or so years ago, I went down to visit my sister in North Carolina. I was living in Massachusetts. That's where I'm from. So I went down to North Carolina, and she, it was a Sunday, and she's like, come on, Joe, let's, let's go down to the, the Sunday 6 o'clock Mass at St. Michael's. I had my conversion in St. Michael the Archangel Parish in Cary, North Carolina. And I was like, Mass? Pfft, I'm not going to Mass, are you kidding me? That's where all those religious people go. I'm not going there. I mean, you guys, I'm telling you, I was, I was not living a good lifestyle. But my sister was very convincing, and she got me to go. And I walked into that church, 
And I saw something I had never witnessed before. It was a church on fire with love for God. And they were praising and worshiping. And I said, is God real? These people sure think that he is. And I was like, whatever these people have, I want it. I want whatever these people have. And I made the decision in that church that I was going to go home and go to confession. And that's what I did. I flew back to Massachusetts. It took me about three weeks to get the courage to go do this. I had some really bad sins and a super long list, right? It's 42 pages long, tight, 10 point, 10, 10 point font. I'm just kidding. It wasn't that long. <laughs> the priest was like, uh, this could take a few months, Joe. <laughs> Um, but you want to know what happened when I went into that confessional and I confessed my sins to that priest and he for absolved me and forgave me of my sins and with the same authority that Jesus has 20 years of mortal sin 7,000 days we're gone. Jesus took them all and he threw them into the abyss of his mercy and he breathed the Holy Spirit of life back into me again. And I knew he was real. I knew he was real. That experience I had, that encounter in the confessional. And something just as amazing began to happen because you guys, I have been trying to get out of this lifestyle for a long time, years. I went church shopping over there, church shopping over there. Oh, where's Jesus at? Here's some good stuff over here. Oh, there's a little, some good stuff over there. But I had a big problem. Might've been some good stuff there, but I couldn't stop sinning. And it wasn't until I walked into that confessional and that priest absolved me of my sins that I was, and Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit of life back into me again. And then I went and I received him in the Holy Eucharist. And his body and his blood were running through my veins. His Holy Spirit was inside of my soul. For the first time, I started to be able to fight those sins because Jesus Christ was inside of my soul fighting those sins with me. His power, His grace, and His mercy. And then I'd have a fall. And I wouldn't be able to fight those sins anymore. And I'd go to confession and He would breathe the Holy Spirit of life back into me again. And I'd be able to fight those sins. That is how important confession is. Confession is so important. I don't care what you've done in your life. If he can forgive me, 27,000 straight days, he will have mercy on anybody who comes into that confessional and repents of their sin with remorse and wants to change their life and not do it again. All of them everyone. Jesus Christ died for every single sin that has ever happened on this earth and ever will happen. Ever. All of them. And he opens that door and invites us. Come to my mercy in the confessional because repentance is a part of and a requirement to getting to divine mercy. Right? We have to repent. It's part of it. Come as you are. Come as you are. He's the healer. He's the savior. You're not going to heal yourself. You're not going to save yourself. Come as you are. His grace, his mercy, and his love, and his truth is what changes us. And this is one of the reasons to die here, you guys. It's unbelievable. It's absolutely unbelievable. Everything lines up with the, the church's teachings, the catechism. Everything lines up with the Bible. 
Like I really think I could give like a four day talk and show you guys the 650 pages and the things Jesus and St. Faustina were saying and be like, there it is in the catechism, there it is in the Bible, but I don't need to because the church already did it for us. And we're not required to believe in the message of divine mercy, it's private revelation. But the church is saying it's worthy of belief and they have looked through it all. So this is diary entry 1181. Jesus says, only mortal sin drives me out of a soul. Nothing else. Venial sin, it doesn't drive him out. You don't have to go to confession to come back into his grace and his mercy and unity with the church. He also says, you know, we like to focus on, we always like to focus like, on all these big things. Like there's a big temptation. Big this, big that, all these people, all this. Th we got to do the big stuff, the big stuff. We got to go on this massive trip. You know what Jesus says about confession in the diary? <laughs> we don't have to go on a massive trip or some huge pilgrimage. Diary entry 1448. Speak of my mercy. Tell souls where they are to look for solace. That is in the tribunal of mercy, the sacrament of reconciliation. There the greatest miracles take place and are incessantly repeated. To avail oneself of this miracle, it is not necessary to go on a great pilgrimage or to carry out some external ceremony. It suffices to come with faith to the feet of my, my representative and to reveal to him one's misery. And the miracle of divine mercy will be fully demonstrated. The miracle of divine mercy restores that soul in full. Isn't that amazing? so amazing. And for the rest of this talk, I'm going to get in deeper into where we think this divine mercy image comes from. And I'm going to start it off with a story. Now, without giving any disrespect to the apostles, because the apostles are greater saints than every, every, any of us could probably ever hope to be, right? They are awesome. So without giving any disrespect to them, I wanted to show and share a scene with you where I think even the apostles may have shown their lack of trust in God's goodness. And before I get into this, I need to rewind a little bit because we need to remember, when we get full focus on what these apostles witnessed, they spent three years with Jesus watching him perform thousands upon thousands upon thousands of miracles, right? At the end of the Gospel of John, I'm paraphrasing here, he says, he supposes that if he were to write down everything that Jesus did, the world couldn't contain the amount of books. I mean, just think about it. The, the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000, that's 9,000 right there. They watched Jesus walk on water, raise people from the dead, cast out demons, cure lepers, cure the, cure the sick, the blind, the deaf, turn water into wine, and the list goes on. And not only that, but they knew his great love. They saw how he encountered sinners, including themselves. And they all promised him, we always focus on Peter, but they all actually said, we will not deny you. And when it came time for their best friend to go to his passion and to go to the cross, they all ran away. And I think, you know, they all went, ran away, right? Nobody went to the cross. None of the apostles went to the cross, right, guys? All right, you guys are awesome. This parish is awesome. Sometimes you go places and people don't even say it. Yes, John went to the cross. And that is a sneak preview for the Mary talk. 
So, you know, his, his best friends, they all say they're not going to deny him. They all do. And you know what? I, I'm just saying it looks like there could be some lack of trust in his goodness because of everything that they saw and they knew who he was. But I'm a human being. If I, if I was them, I would have probably run for the hills too. This guy's going to get crucified. They're probably going to crucify me. Right? I'm a coward. Jesus is the only thing that gives me any courage and the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary. I'm a coward. I would have ran. I understand. And now I want to point to you guys to what Jesus did to his best friends, the apostles, after they turned their backs on him for everything, after everything that he did, when he needed them the most. And this is the scene in the Bible that we believe the divine mercy image comes from. John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. And just to give a little bit of backdrop, Jesus has already resurrected. The apostles are kind of aware, but maybe not fully aware that he's resurrected yet. They're up in, in that upper room with all the doors locked, right? Right? On the evening of that, that first day of the week, when the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. The first words out of his mouth. Shouldn't he have gone in there? These are... He showed them all these miracles, all of his love. They said they wouldn't deny him. Shouldn't he have gone in there? Where were you when I needed you? How dare you do that to me? You're cut off from heaven forever. But he doesn't do that. Because that is not who he is. First words out of his mouth. Peace be with you. Because he knew that they were scared. The disciples knew that they just turned their back on not just their best friend, Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, the Christ. They turned their backs on God. And they were scared the Jews were going to come and crucify them too. Jesus knew this. Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I now send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. Do you guys know how many times God breathes on man in salvation history? In the whole Bible, does anybody know how many times God actually breathes on man? It's a good guess. It's actually two. And the first one, he breathes life into Adam in Genesis. And the second one is this moment. I wish God would take like a highlighter, right? Like, put a big highlighter there, God. Well, he did. Because people who knew the scriptures before and who know them now would know this is a big deal. God just breathed on man again. And what does he do in this moment? He doesn't say, go do this or go do that. He says this. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. He is passing on his authority to forgive sins to the apostles, who have then passed it down to the bishops and the priests 
throughout the ages the same authority to forgive sins that Jesus has. And, you know, we have different places where the Catholic Church gets the sacrament of reconciliation from. You know, sacred tradition. There's other places in the Bible, too, absolutely. But this, John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23, this is the primary place in the Bible where the Catholic Church gets the sacrament of confession. And I'm not saying that this is what it is, but in a certain sense, with the story that I just shared with you, you can kind of see the sacrament of confession. The apostles turn their back on the Lord, right? When we turn our back and we sin, we go and we run and hide. They went to the room and they were hiding out of fear of the Jews, right? And then... Jesus comes when we go to the confessional and, he, and confess our sins and he breathes the Holy Spirit of life back into us, right? And it's so difficult for us. It is. Because we, not, I mean, we have these battles with trusting in his goodness, with our distorted image, right? And we might be like, what's he going to say? Is he going to change his mind this time? Is he not going to forgive me this time? Well, I think I have an idea of what he's going to say. Peace be with you. So why do we think that this is where the divine mercy image comes from? Because every year... On Divine Mercy Sunday, which is the Sunday after Easter, right? And even before it was called Divine Mercy Sunday, this was a great solemnity. Jesus points out in the diary of St. Faustina to St. Faustina, but who even knows this, this feast even exists? This is great solemnity. And when you guys watch Divine Mercy 101, Father Chris Alar is going to explain the octave of Easter and how in a certain sense the eighth and final day can be the biggest part of the celebration with the biggest graces. I'm not going to get into that. He's, he explains it much. I'm, I can't even touch where he goes with that. I'm, not, I'm no theologian. But isn't, isn't this amazing? Every year, Divine Mercy Sunday, you know what the reading is in the Gospel? John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. This is Jesus walking through the walls or appearing or whatever the case is to the apostles. God doesn't do anything by accident and he gives us saints for a reason. Our image of God is extraordinarily important. Extraordinarily important. He wants us to know who he is. He's giving us this big reminder that we... He's pointing to a big problem. Our lack of trust in his goodness and our distorted image are a big problem for us. And he wants us to remember who he is. And believe me, I'm not going to get into the great promises. Venerating this image has some extraordinary promises. I mean extraordinary. But what did he tell St. Faustina to put at the bottom? Jesus, I trust in you. We lack trust in his goodness. He wants us to trust in his goodness. So he's trying to reveal to us his image so that we can, right? 